Today on Time Out Coaching, we have a real rising star in British coaching. Currently the assistant coach at Mombus Obradorio in the ACB. Please welcome Coach Dan Petz. Coach. Hi, Tony. Thank you. you. Um, we have to tell the viewers and the listeners um, that, uh, you know, we, we, I, I messed up the first one, uh, which was a fantastic um, podcast, and we got to the end and somehow something hadn't recorded. So we're, we're doing this for the second time. Um, I think you've got an incredible story. So we know um, I want to really get into this journey. Um, and I, and I, I, you know, I don't want to make it, um, you know, sound negative, but, you know, it's almost a journey from nowhere to, you know, to the highest levels of, of basketball in the world. And I think it's really an interesting route that you've taken. So let's get straight into, you know, talking about how you were introduced to basketball and, and how this, you know, propelled you to where you are at this moment. Sure. So yeah, like I said, it's uh, it's, uh, it's not a, not a traditional route, perhaps, into into the sport. Um, I'm born and raised in in, in Whitton, between Champs and Colchester in Essex, um, an area which has no tradition of no tradition whatsoever. Of basketball is um, even now doesn't have doesn't have a basketball team. Doesn't have you know um, you know it's, it's a cricket, football, rugby, golf, uh, these kind of sports, and we grew up playing those kind of sports. Um, it wasn't until I was a little bit older, around about 10 or 11, where we started, where there was, appeared like a, a small basketball club in, in Whitham in the, in the sport, was Brampton Sports Centre, which doesn't exist anymore. And a coach in the name of Darren um, from Chelmsford, I don't know, he was a PE teacher, uh, started to run a, a, cl a club once a week and we got involved with that. I'm not sure how, how we got involved with it, but we ended up going and, you know, you do the normal things, you know, learn to shoot, you shoot in form learn to make layups, learn to dribble the ball, you know, all these kind of uh, fundamentals, um, were, were important fundamentals in, in that part. And we kind of fell in love with it from there, really, um, doing that once a week. And then as we moved into, moved up, you know, into secondary school, that's when we kind of got um, more interested in the game, had a group of friends in, in Molden, uh, which is called the next town to Whitton, where I went to school, um, where we just kind of, we kind of fell in love with basketball. It was right around the time where, where Channel 5 had the NBA games, started to have the college game. So we kind of we kind of followed basketball. That was our kind of our, our way of getting into the game. And there was a couple of coaches, um, a couple of young guys who were students at the school, or sixth formers at the school who were getting into coaching. Uh, they were interested in Phil Jackson there and uh, the you know the balls, the, the balls dynasty and uh, the triangle offense and all these kind of things. So they kind of got took us in, you know, in lunch times and and after school clubs and um, and that's where we started to play basketball and those guys were, were Byron Pin and Alex De Rich, who aren't coaching anymore but they were really our, our first coaches and um, they started the club at the school and we got involved in there and that moved in from from there into into looking for national league for, for, for a club team to play for now and we sure. had to go a little bit further afield and the nearest clubs were, were in Chelmsford or in Wickford or in in Colchester Colchester where Mike Lloyd was and um, we ended up going to I ended up going to play in in Wickford when I was a little bit older, uh, National League, that was my first National League experience. But apart from that, we, you know, we, we did basketball because we loved it, we enjoyed it. It was very, it was a sociable thing for us. There wasn't a lot else to do after school on the weekends in where we lived. You know, if you didn't play football, if you didn't play cricket or any of these things, then, you know, there wasn't a lot to do. So basketball was what we kind of warmed to on the outside courts, uh, after school every day, we'd shoot, play 1v1. Um, and that was kind of, that was kind of what we did. And at the same time, I started to coach in, start to coach uh, that school team. So the group of friends that um, had there, I started to to kind of be the, not the leader, but, you know, for, kind of give structure to a little bit of the practice where there weren't coaches. And uh, that was kind of my first dabble in, in, in coaching as well. Right. Uh, but at this time, you were not really understanding about coaching itself and you were probably still focused on trying to play. Um, and I'm assuming, you know, at this time, you're also thinking about um, university and a career path. So, you know, what, how did that happen and what was the next move, move after that? Exactly. So no idea really with, with coaching. It was just kind of doing what, what other coaches had, had, had put us through, uh, repeating the same drills, repeating the same phrases, uh, the same concepts, you know. So we didn't really have any idea. Um, finished school, not really knowing what I wanted to do. Um, and I like sport, I like basketball, so um, opted to go with the sports science route in university. Went to study in Portsmouth um, in the sports science degree, 
And um, that's where I really kind of got introduced to coaching. Um, was looking for to get into into coaching in a, in a more serious way. And um, that was kind of my first job as well um, in the community program down there. A guy called uh, Manuel Davis, who's who's not there anymore, but he but built the kind of the Portsmouth City um, basketball community club system there between the schools. And uh, met him one day after a scrimmage and. Um, yeah, that was my first kind of first time I had a team under 12s team and and uh, first time coaching and that moved into the the national the Portsmouth City National League was a coach there as well and um, play at the same time playing what was involved with Mick Byrne was 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 my coach there a little bit uh, the, in the university I had a had a good relationship with the the women's coach there which was Ben Stanley who's not there anymore but he was he was also the the coach of the of what the APC was back yeah. in back in those days, the APC yeah. system. So got got my foot in the door with him into the APC, and um, that was kind of my first experience, if you like, with a with a higher level, you no know, higher level of player, um, sure. you know, national league, premier uh, players, some you know borderline uh, national team players in the in the APC system. So that was kind of my my first kind of dabble with with serious coaches, and I started to learn about coaching. Uh, properly through that through that through that experience did you uh did you do did, did, um, you you had to have taken your um your uh basketball england um coaching awards at that time level one level two who who took your courses there and uh you know what kind of experience was that as well yeah so the level one and level two did in portsmouth that was with mick with mick Byrne. okay was on um, on the uh yeah on the level two and then when i finished university did the level three and that was with joe moore Right. Okay. So John Moore was my was my coach tutor yeah. on the on the no, sorry, coach John Moore was my coach tutor on the level two. Right. And on my level three, Vanessa Ellis was one of the tutors. Wow. And okay. I can't tell you, and I can't tell you who the who the main tutor was. It wasn't a coach. It was somebody oh. who was involved with the with the Manchester Giants, but wasn't a coach. Um, right. Okay. Around the, the the main part of the, the theoretical part of the of the course, if you like. So sure. That's where I did the those courses yeah okay awesome um so now you're at university and you know you're getting some rep reps both community coaching um you know what, what were you thinking about that uh, you know the early parts there are you you know are you are you trying to coach in a certain style are you you know heavily trying to concentrate on fundamental skill you know or you were doing tactical type stuff what was what were some of your thoughts at the those early early parts there yeah, so we were, so I mean, for the first part at least, we were working with young players under you know under twelve guys, primary school kids. So it was all um, games, you know, working small small games. Um, you know, in that, in that moment, we didn't really know. Like I said, like we didn't really have a good idea of what we were doing. So we were doing ball handling, you know, with balloons and with two balls and all these kind of things that perhaps don't have a direct transfer to the game. Now, if I did, if I did it again, probably wouldn't have worked in that way. But in that moment, that's what we knew. No, that was the coaches that were around us were doing the same things so we were copying. Sure. And, you know, the internet and the coaching uh, library that the internet is now wasn't as developed as it is now. Um, so that was kind of where we worked on. And then from that, when it started to go with the national team, national league, sorry, uh, teams, it was kind of, I was kind of more um, focused on developing the team, okay, developing the players in the skill the skills as well, but more developing the team, how the team played and, and perhaps wrongly, perhaps wrongly so, um, I would have if, if I did it again now. I would have perhaps gone more in the in the player development role, even in even working with those with those younger teams. But when we didn't really know what we were doing, um, mm. we were you know we were interested in the tactical side, we were interested in the five v five side, and perhaps that wasn't the the way to go. But you know everyone has to has to learn, and what sure. you don't know, what you don't know. So that was yeah. kind of where we were in that moment. Okay. Um, and from from the university, um, you're saying you're in you're in the APC um, system now. You know the regional system, which is um, something you you know you have gone through some of the pathway. Um, you know in international teams. Um, what was what was your next stop um, after after Portsmouth University? Yes, yeah, so I came back from so came back from university. Didn't really have a lot of. Um... Didn't really have a lot of options there in terms of work, so I came back home for for a little bit, and um, that's why I kind of got wanted to continue with going with coaching. Between that, I'd also I'd also got uh, had an opportunity to coach, or be an assistant coach on the under 17s, uh, would be the southeast regional team in that moment, 
uh, where I was working. That was a big step. That was a big step up working with Paul Sparrowhawk as, uh, as his assistant. I uh, don't know how I got it. I uh, handed my name, typical, writing an email to when the job application appeared on, on the on the Basketball England website and um, got the opportunity to go there and uh, work with uh, work with Paul Sparrowhawk. And that was my first kind of experience to, you know, to, to, to really borderline national team players. Luke Nelson was in that tit, was in that squad. Sure. And um, a couple of other players as well who um, who are now playing in the professional le- playing at the professional level. Um, so that was kind of my first experience. And then I was, like I said, I was li- I was also living at home. So I got in touch with with Mark Lloyd, who's who's you know, quite well known as the GB national team team manager and the women's team manager right now. Uh, he lives in Colchester and he was running the club out of Colchester. So I got involved with got involved with Lloydie and he just taken on the APC in Essex. So got moved straight over from the South APC to the East APC. Um, got involved with uh, got to know really well Darren Johnson and you know the the local coaching community. Even though I was a player in that coaching community, didn't really it didn't really have a good um, many net, you know as a network. Didn't really sure. know the coaches as well as as well as I did in after having done this uh, this APC opportunity. So that was the started there. Started working with him more in the sports science role uh, in strength and conditioning, performance analysis, which was kind of my what I was kind of leading to after coming out of university. Mm. And he got me um, introduced to Warwick Can. Warwick, Warwick Can just came in. This would have been about 2000, I want to say it's 2013. Um, he got me introduced to Warwick Can and said, this guy is, is interested in doing performance analysis, these kind of things, uh, this kind of area. You know, is, um, is there any opportunity to, to go with the national teams and work, work alongside the national teams? And uh, that's where I got in with the under-17s, which was the, the New Horizons program, I think it was called back then. So I was in with uh, with with Simon Fisher and with with Mark Stuto, and that was my first first experience of national teams coaching, thrown in the deep end. Absolutely, sure. not really having much of an idea, but uh, that was the first chance there. Just a quick one, so that um, some of the younger coaches um, they can listen to this, and 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 that's why I think that you really got this interest in um, background. Um, talk to me quickly about how you got into in performance analysis. I mean, you have this, um, you know, science, you know, sports science background, you, you do, you, you're doing some of the strength and conditioning stuff, which is, I think is um, any coach has to have a real understanding of the body of the, of the basics of sport of strength and conditioning. We don't have to, we don't have to have like my ex SNC coaches, Jose Fernandez. He's at the Houston Astros at the moment. Um, he was like well class. I don't need to have his knowledge, but or Duncan French, you know, who's the head of UFC. But we have to have some basic SNC knowledge, you know, how to build systems, you know, how, how to build strength and endurance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What about come to performance analysis now? How did you get into that? And did you just learn it on the fly, or did you have someone? talk to you did you did you go online to get some of this information i'd be really interested to know about that yeah i'm not sure actually i'm not i mean in university obviously we had that we had that that was kind of part of the curriculum um you know working with the video and you know working the video and tra- turning that into some kind of qualitative quantitative information um and i just kind of leaned towards the scouting area the the tactical part like we talked about before um i always kind of leaned towards that um, so when I when I first got in touch with Mark, I was just kind of dabbling in that area, you know, learning and trying different things out, see what Mark Mark would like, um, asking Mark questions about, you know, you know, way the, the way things work, and then giving those kind of those clips that feedback back to him on terms of this his, his offensive defensive systems, giving feedback to players via the video. So that was kind of my first. Um, that was kind of how we started getting into getting into that and. Um, well, later we can we can talk uh, we can talk about more. But that later I did a masters in that area, and obviously that's where I kind of built my my big knowledge base of, in, right. in that area. You okay. know, my expertise in that area. Yeah, no, that, that's a that's a great that's a great point. So you're in Essex, um, you know, you're working with all of these, you know, really um, good coaches who you know ha- uh, are giving you. You got into the national team situation um, with Mark and with Warwick. Um, what's the next phase after that? You know, you go to you go to Nottingham um, to, to university. There is that correct? Well, actually, no. Just before that, so down the under seventeen did the the tournament with um, which was out in Sherbourne. Went to a tournament, and that, as soon as we came back from that, I had a job offer to go to the to go and work on the in work for the Olympics um, for the Olympic uh, committee. And at the same time as I had that job offer, which was a really good job offer, a really good job offer. 
uh, Warwick called me to ask me if I wanted to do the under 18s as the performance analyst, as the performance analyst coach, as it was known in that in in that in that moment. And uh, that was with Steve. I was working with Steve, so it was a tough decision because the under 18s was was no money. But you know, working in basketball, traveling to to Bosnia to the to the European Championship, or go and work for the for the Olympics. In the end, I decided to go you know, follow my heart a little bit and went with the the basketball opportunity and uh, turned up in Nottingham one Saturday and. That was my first um, first encounter with Steve Buckner, which was quite an intimidating uh, yeah. first experience. And not having known Steve, um, obviously known about Steve for his for his for his reputation, his prestige that he has as a as a as a player, yeah. but um, never having worked with you know with, with a professional coach in, in that kind of a, an environment was quite intimidating in the first moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's interesting. Uh, Steve's uh, stature um, as a person yeah. oh. is is immense and uh, when he walks in the room every you know you know about it and you don't yeah. even have to know that he's you there he's, you don't you know exactly it. you yeah. feel it and i i remember as a as a as still fairly young coach you know when i well, I had coached him uh, on the national team, you know, even before that, super young coach uh, as Laszlo's assistant. But um, then I signed him to a short-term contract. Um, actually, you know, he, he won a couple of big European games for me at Birmingham Bullets. And, um, yeah, but he's, you know, that's a, that's a immense character. And so I can fully understand how that, how that, how you would feel as a, as a younger coach. So, so you gained great experience from that. And um, so that is that propelling you now you're starting to see is this is is this a time where you're starting to think career and this is what I want to do or you still are unsure which direction you're going to go into? Absolutely. That experience definitely pushed me into the performance analysis area. Um, first started to work with Steve, built a good relationship with Steve. Um, and I felt like I was useful in that role. I think Steve felt I was useful in that role, kept me on for, for another year after that. So must have done something right. And that was when I decided, okay, yeah, I'm going to try and I'm going to study to, I'm going to study in this area, in the performance analysis area. So I did a master and that was in Nottingham, which was an Erasmus, Erasmus performance analysis master where you did three months in Germany, three months in Nottingham and three months in, three months in Spain. So at the same time as that was going on, working with the national team, flying back between Germany and, uh, and England for national team camps. One of the national team camps was run by, uh, they brought a Spanish coach over the name of uh, Gustavo Aranzana, now he's coaching Yeda in, in Le Gold here in, in, in Spain. And um, he kind of put me in touch with, uh, who was the assistant coach at the time in Valencia uh, under Parasovic. Um, and I was going. To, I knew I was going to do that that placement in Valencia in six months' time. So I'd already started to to build a report with his assistant coach. Hey, I'm okay. I'm coming out in this month. I'd really love to watch a practice. I'd really love to just sit and talk with you and, and you know, have a coffee together. And uh, that that happened. And um, when I arrived to Valencia on the last part of the part of the Masters, started to get involved with Valencia, what uh, with their youth, their academy, which was really small compared to what it is now. Now it's one of the biggest, biggest. academies in in Europe. But um, so right the then it didn't, it didn't stroke, have nothing. Stroke the world. Stroke exactly. the world. You know that's... exactly right. Then they were working out out of a warehouse with you know with three team three academy teams, and I was involved with those with those guys and. Um, and at the end of that that master's uh, program, I had to do a one year one year internship, which was which was funded by the by the Not University of Not or Nottingham Trent University. Um, and I kind of spoke with his coach that there was any possibility of doing it in Valencia with the first team. So well, the coach is a little bit it's a little bit tricky, um, but I do know a coach in, in another place who might be interested. And called this coach, who was Moncho Fernandez of Fabuloiro, and one month later. Um, Monch was calling me and uh, offering me if, uh, if I'd like to come and do uh, come to the preseason and, and we'd speak and, and see whether it was a good fit and whether I could I could uh, add some value in in the team and eight years later I'm, st I'm still here yeah. still hanging in unbelievable so to link this and I want to do that um, very quickly um, when you go to when you arrive in Spain and Valencia are you um, is this just life changing and you realize straight away, this is really where, if I want to be involved in basketball, this is where I want to be, or was it, you know, wow, just the, the, the standard, the way they're teaching, you know, was all of those factors involved with you to say, this is really what I should be trying to do, or was it just a, a circumstantial situation that just happened to happen? 
no, everything. I think everything about it was what you know. I wanted to, as soon as I arrived in Valencia, I knew that you know I wanted to be involved in in the in the in the Spanish, well, not Spanish, but elite level basketball, especially at this level. You know, having watched you know the players, how they trained, um, how the you know this performance analysis and sports science uh, area was evolving, developing in in Spain. I wanted to be part of that. Um, the opportunity in in Obrador, where it was a small club that had just come that come a couple of seasons before from from the Lev Gold. Uh, was small, was building, and needed a lot. It, they wanted somebody who could who could work in those kind of areas. Um, it was very it was very attractive for for that reason. But I know I want my heart said I wanted to work in basketball, and uh, the the ACB league was the you know was the best the best chance to do it. You know. Yeah, oh, that's awesome. And so you also we're going to come back to obviously your present role and how it looks. But um, you know, you you also um, became in this a full assistant coach on the on the U 18s team. Um, is that right? Some yes, absolutely. Yeah. So that was so I kind of transitioned um, after I did a did a year, a year under Carl as a, as the the second assistant or the performance analysis coach that was known then. Uh, with Nick Drain, and then after the following year, I transitioned into the into the into the first assistant uh, with under Carl, and did another year with him on the under twenties. Brought me in on the under twenties as well as assistant coach. So yeah, brought, built a really good relationship. I think when we, the relationship we built, I built with Carl was when he was well, I was assistant with him with Steve. Um, we built a really good relationship there, and that kind of carried through even until now. It's one of the one of the you know the coaches in England I'm you know most most in contact with most most uh, report I have I, I, I would say and um, so yeah that was a kind of transition to that to that assistant role which was which was tricky at first but um, uh, we, over time I think we've, we've improved and uh, done a little bit better in that in, in that way you know right so now you get to an ACB club um, you know you're still a young coach um, talk to me about you know what you did at the start and slowly how your role has changed over time absolutely yeah so when I came in as an intern um, came in and with, with that in mind the performance analysis side the strength and conditioning side be involved shadowing you know watching what watching what they were doing you know really really trying to learn every day on the job uh, what they're doing and trying to trying to add value in anything I could, uh, whether that's um, preparing some video for the coach, um, doing some kind of individual work with one of the players when one of the other coaches could not. Uh, just trying to throw my throw my hands into anything, anything I could. Um, and then, luckily, with after that first year of inter, of the internship, it coincided where the club was going through a transition in terms of building an academy. Um, so my role, kind of the club's need needed you know coaches for the for the academy so that need crime created a job opportunity for me so i kind of moved from more more as a less as a performance analyst more into a coaching role that start with the with the academy having an uh, academy team and then working you know more 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 commonly known as a coach on the on the first team you know as a, as a third assistant with two assist to have two assistants head coach and i'll be the third assistant so not a bench assistant but behind the bench Doing other, doing other kind of stuff, individual work with the with the players, video from practice, from games, um, kind of uh, whatever the coach, whatever the coaching staff kind of needs, and that's that's a changing, a changing um, demand every week, every day, every season. It kind of depends what how we're working and what we're working on. Um, trying to just add value in any way I can. So that's even, you, even now. Are you? Um, I I didn't ask this question last time, but are you involved in? like the long-term development like a sorry a long-term scouting and development of players so you know trying to analyze players both imports and also uh spanish international players to bring into either academy or pro situations is is that part of what you do now exactly so that's kind of my that's kind of my big my big main role within the club right now so there's kind of two sides to that there's a side where it's um where it's looking for players for for the first team or for academy teams, specifically from under 16s upwards, where we're looking for players from outside of the Galician region, from maybe outside of Spain. So it's looking, working with or speaking with agents, um, looking at the you know the, for the Euroleague competitions, any sure. of the inter, of the national national competitions under 16, under 18s, um, having that having that information, um, capturing that information and making recommendations of players that we could sign um, on scholarship. And then the other side, obviously, is the is the first team players. Is is collecting information about both the 
both the the players that the GM of the club has identified, collecting information about you know how are they, how is their character, how is how do they fit in with a within a within a group, how do they work with coaches, how do they respond to different uh, coaching, you know the coach gets mad at them, how do they respond, what's you know those kind of softer skills, mm. is something that we value very very highly. So that's kind of a a job which I try I I kind of uh, I kind of coordinate. You know, speaking with as many coaches and agents as possible. Uh, former player, former teammates, other players, to kind of build a build a knowledge base about a player that we might sign because we don't have enough we don't have enough budget to make mistakes with with guys we sign. Sure, sure. So yeah. so that's one part of the job that I do now, and the other part of the job is kind of nurturing players from the academy who transition into the professional game. So whether that's they transition from the academy to play with our ACB team or to train with our ACB team, or if they transition to play with another team in in a lower level or in another country or or whatever. So mm. I kind of sit between the academy and the first team in, in, in that respect, work with those those individ, those players who, who practice both with the ACB or play with the ACB, work with them on an individual basis. And um, also I, I coach my own team on, on the academy, which is the under-18 under 18 team. Okay. Just going back to that, um, scouting, especially with the, with the professional players, you know, analysing those team players, uh, how much do you get involved with um, the physical aspects of the player and specifically the word that I used in the past two or three seasons is durability. Um, it's almost like once upon a time, you know, we would have talked about character upside, you know, you know, potential, what can he bring? What, what's his, what's his, what's his skill set? You know, his major part of his skill set. How does he fit into the system? All of those things. I actually added durability as one of the key factors to a professional player because it doesn't matter how good that player is. If he can't stay on the floor, he can't help you win. So it's actually, yeah. you know, is it better to have a great player that, 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 that can play only, you know, 40% of the games or a player that plays 100% of the games from, well, pretty much 100% of the games? Who, who, who gets involved in that? Is that SNC stroke, you know, the, 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 the SSC side or is that you? also doing that research and, and looking at those type of uh, factors yeah so it's, it's, it's a collab it's a collaborative um collaborative job in that respect um we work uh, whenever i speak with 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 a coach or, or or someone someone who we identified to to get information from one of the questions is how was the how was that player's injury passed and also we'll look back over there over the previous i normally look about five seasons back to see if there's any big big gaps in the in the schedule that they haven't played so if there's a big gap for say two one or two months then i'll always ask i'll always ask okay, what happened what happened between january and march why didn't this why didn't this guy play between january and march um and that's kind of the first part that's kind of the first the first area and once we've identified if a player has a or an injury risk or or some kind of element that that troubles us or gives us some kind of uh, reason to have a doubt then that's when the physical coach or the physiotherapist or the medical staff will get involved in terms of determining the player. And then repeat, obviously, if we sign a player, sometimes we have to take a risk and we'll sign a player who had an injury, an injury part. And then obviously when they do the, when they do the first medical exam, then sometimes, you know, the player can, that player can get cut if it's not, if it's, if it's an injury that, you know, is not, you know, unconsiderable, no, but normally that doesn't happen. Normally they arrive here and we try and work with those players so they don't, re-injure themselves we try and build their build their muscle their, you know the supporting muscle areas up so that they don't have any any chance of re-injury um but yeah it's important it's definitely the durability thing is key it's, it's, there's no doubt about that mm, really interesting um just going back to you now um you're into this you know this spanish um style of play system um did you have to take by the way any of the spanish coaching awards is that, is that something? Absolutely, yeah. So um, my first year, I didn't, I didn't do it. Um, I didn't have to, didn't have to do it. I actually had, I was kind of an assistant coach. Had a coach, or the 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 head of the academy was kind of the head coach of the team that I coached, but he didn't go on, he didn't sit on the bench. So he right. just signed the papers at the end of the and the score score sheet at the end of the game, and I'd coach. And then after that, I started to do once my Spanish had improved a little bit. Sure. Um, that's when I started to do the take the take the qualifications, and I finished the finished the qualifications a couple of years ago. So I have now the the highest level in in Spain. It's a three it's a three year process. Now 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 the qualifications are changing here. 
before they were like in the UK where you did, the, you know, did like a, a, a week or during the, during the summer holidays or, or weekend, a couple of weekend courses and they'd give you the, they give you the badge. But now you have to do a whole year in college, three years of college to, to get the highest, to get the highest level. Wow. So it's a That's... full-time, it's a full-time um, study system now to get yeah. to, to be a coach here. So it's not, it's not easy. It's not a, it's not a straightforward oh. process. And, so, only, yeah, look, and only in Spanish, like, like the French system as well. Only in Absolutely, Spanish. Absolutely. Yeah. Only in Spanish. Only in Spanish. So you have to be able to, yeah, obviously you have done basketball. This is international, but you have to be able to, you know, answer exams. You have to be able to speak in Spanish, be able to write. And these kind of things are important. So yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, let's talk about uh, what does a typical week um, look like for you now and for the club? So um, most uh, game day Saturday or Sunday, is that right? Let's say. Yeah. So except this year, this year's this year yeah. can be any day. But any day. But uh, it's, typically, yes. it's typically, typically a Saturday or Sunday. So let's say the game is on a Saturday. Um, what would the typical week normally look like for you? Um, you know, is is Sunday? I mean, I meant to ask you this: uh, is if the game is played on Saturday, is Sunday the day off, or is Monday the day off? And Sunday is like, uh, um, you know, working, you know, con the conditioning of the body, uh, active recovery. Sorry, is but what's yeah, what? typically, yeah, typically will be Sunday. Typically, typically Sunday will be, be the Sunday. day off, and okay. then the guys come back on Monday morning. And then normally start Monday morning with we'd normally run a, a physical practice, so the gym work for an hour and an hour on the court uh, in the morning, and then do a full practice, full two hour pra or an hour and a half practice on, on the evening. In the evening, that would be the the team practice. Normally, when we combine gym and court on the same in the same morning, normally it's a non-contact practice. So that's be five to zero, where the coach is going to put something new in, or he wants to emphasize something that's going to be important for the week. Uh, we're doing five e zero, or the guys will just shoot. We get 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 a volume of shots up as well in in, in that one hour practice on Monday morning. Do, um, yeah, so. What what's the uh, uh, when is the first review session of the game from Saturday? Is there a so, team review again? Yeah, again, it's not it's not something that we have set in stone. It's something that that changes depending the circumstances, depending the week. But typically, the typically the coach likes uh, coach here likes to work with um, two video video review sessions per game, one for defense, one for offense. And the defensive one will typically coincide with the the defensive practice. The coach likes to work um, with you know a couple of objects for your practice. So, for example, if the practice the one practice will be defense where the main objective of that practice will just be on defense on this, defense on this, defense on this. So the, the video will will coincide with that practice and the same with the offense. So the, the first um, 5v5 uh, offensive practice, um, that video will go right before. So that's what mm. we'll do the review of the, the offensive part of the game, just so we can, we are, we believe that that enhances the, tra the transference stuff. of the video if you go to the court and you work on that stuff right after. So that's is, the reason for that the philosophy is, is the is the review video um the, the 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 main review videos are they available to the players to watch um externally or are they just shown from a from in a team in a team setting we like to do in a, in a team setting if the player asks for it normally normally we'll quite happily we'll give, we'll give it to the player but normally it's not something we give straight direct to the player we give normally we do it between a team because there's a lot of information a lot of details that uh, the coach wants to go through and wants you know wants everyone to see it's not just uh, okay if one player has done something wrong or done something good here it's not just for that player it's for the other to reinforce behaviors for the rest of the team as well so the coach prefers you know to go with you know the video session with all the players and going through all the details and and not you know call individual guys out if not you know put the if there's things to blame it's on the team and if there's things that are good it's on the team as well yeah great stuff so yeah. monday monday uh gym uh walk through or shoot in and then team practice tuesday yeah yeah tuesday. normally is one yeah normally do so we normally go if we do if we do a double practice on one day, the set the next day along will be a one practice day. Okay. So we'll normally do three practices a break, and then we'll go with another three practices and a break or the game normally okay. coincides with the game. So okay. Tuesday be one practice, um, Wednesday gym in the morning practice on the, in the in the evening, gym gym and uh, walk the practice maybe or not just gym maybe, and then the and then the team practice on the afternoon, 
Thursday one practice, Friday one practice, and then game Saturday with the Saturday with normally if the game Saturday night will be a walkthrough on the sure. on the Saturday morning. We're just walk through walking through um, some specific sets that we didn't cover during the week. We didn't see during the week that we need to give specific attention. Normally it's like uh, out of bounds situations or after after timeout situations are those kind of situations that feature there. And the guys get a lot of uh, shooting volume out, so they shoot shooting volume, so they are comfortable. And then a big chance to rest. And normally we have the, the rest time together. We go to a hotel, uh, the players rest in the hotel together, eat lunch together, and then we go back to the gym to play in the in the evening. In the evening. Um, mm. Friday, the Friday, the day before the game, is that a taped contact practice or a non-contact or or semi-contact practice? Yeah, the only non-contact practices really are those are those morning practices after after the gym and the, and the Saturday morning. Uh, before the game, those are the only non-contact ones. The other, all the other practices are taped, mm. uh, to a tape and and full contact, five v five, maybe not full court, but at least on the half court with some with with, with defense. Uh, coach believes in that. Normally he'll work. Normally the the process that we follow is the first three days. So if we say Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, are dedicated to to us to improving things from the previous game and starting starting to orientate the way we do things to the rival. What I mean by that is. If offensively we know they're going to run a certain type of defense, for example, on the pick and roll, they're going to run show defense on the pick and roll in in the majority of these situations. Then during Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we'll start conditioning the practice to to attack that. Mm. But it was not until Thursday and Friday where we really go specific on what we With call the, the game plan, no, yeah. on the, yeah, on the yeah. tactical game plan. Awesome. Great stuff. Um, talk a little bit about working with uh, Coach Montu Fernandez, um, you know, really a, 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 a legend now in, in Spain, someone that has taken a program, you know, up on, like you've said many times, on a on a small, one of the smallest budgets. It is the, one of the smallest budgets, is it, is it not? In, in yeah, the bottom ACB. three, yeah. Bottom three, one yeah. of the bottom three budgets, yeah. 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 So yeah, Mancho yeah, is, is, a, is a great, first off, he's a really, really great guy um, off the court, really open guy, um, really authentic um, and very demanding. I think that's the, the best way I would, I, would, I would say to describe him. His, um, his philosophy is absolutely on, on the small details. You know, the small details that make the, make the difference and they're the things that win, that win and lose games. And he's very, very demanding on those. In example, even if, for example, if I pair a video, and there's one word that's the wrong color or, or something like this, then you have to do it again. It's, it, that's the level of detail that he wants, you know, in, in every every single thing, whether it's on court, whether it's off court, whether it's in video, whether it's in scouting report. Um, he's, he's all about that. Uh, and the second thing I think really defines him as uh, in terms of philosophy is that he's a, he's a coach that's really orientated to, to, to the players. Now, everything that we do is to give players freedom to play. Although we look, you know, we run a lot of, uh, Monch is quite well known for, um, you know, innovating offensively and defensively, perhaps, and a lot of structure and a lot of long sets with a lot of screen, a lot of off screens actions, these kind of things. Really, the all the all the actions that we have have complete freedom for the player that we're playing for. You know, the Ooh. players are the ones who decide. They're the, they're the actors on the court. So whether that's offensively or defensively, they are making decisions. So, for example, on the on the on the on the defensive end on the ball screens with players, we give them. And from a scouting point of view, we give them, you know, orientation. We give them ideas about what they should do, what the game plan, is, what the game plan is, and what kind of decisions they should take on the ball screen. But they decide how they guard the ball screen. We don't say, okay, always on the middle ball screen, you've got to do this. Very rare that we'll say that. No, we give mm. them, hey, it's better with this player you do this because he's very good uh, with a right hand attack. And so it's better you do show when he goes to the goes to the right hand, for example. Mm. So that's kind of that's kind of his philosophy in in a nutshell. Demanding on on the on the small details, um, play or play very player centered in in terms of in terms of the way we play tactically. Uh, mm. There's a lot of lot of freedom to the players to play, and the other thing is just very 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 demanding on the basic things. Um, okay, we, we we talk about a lot about you know the the schemes and the the defensive schemes, the offensive sets and whatever, but his really his interest is in that we rebound well, we play good one one v one defense because in the end, when you go and look at the all this all the pre post games, that's where the games are lost. That's what exactly pass lines and one v one, good defensive yeah. transition, passing yeah. the ball, don't turn the ball over on offense. And that's really where his where his focus is. Hmm. 
I mean, I, I do think that, um, I mean, there's, uh, there, I mean, there could be many people can look at it in, in different ways. Um, the game has got, you know, in the analyzation of the game is incredible. The, the detail now, um, you know, hey, this guy, you know, you've got to, you've got to chase him off the right corner because that's his favorite spot, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But ultimately this game does come down to some simplistic type stuff. Like you say, exactly. you know, exactly. um, offensive rebounding like you say defensive transition turnovers missed layups you know um all of those kind of things are, are really key things that can can kill a team you know one or two times in a game so um, it's really rare it's really rare that we lose a game because of the pick and roll defense was wrong yeah. it's, but it's very common <laughs> well, that we lose a game because we didn't play good transition defense and I, I, I found that out the hard way, um, even last season. And I always tell this story. I think we had a discussion about it um, where, you know, I can, as a, as a coach, dictate and, and blow up uh, a, a play of the opposing team. But like I said to my team many times, once I blow the play, once we blow the play, play up as a, as a group, and we make that we make them do something they don't want to do now we've got to win the next battle so you know we've got to if if we've switched or whatever the scenario is um and now it's a one-on-one -on -one scenario a player has to make a shot or make a drive we've got to stop that and we can't just think exactly. because we've done something really well tactically that the play is over if they hit a free because they can move the ball quickly or they penetrate and they collapse the defense and they kick it out you know then the defense hasn't done its job in a in a fundamental way so yeah it's a Sorry. really interesting one from there um more. let's talk quickly about um just a couple of those key tactics that we talk that we've talked about um the next um ball screen defense i mean um when i came to you and and asked you to break that down you know it was incredible you knew you know absolutely all of the detail for it i was shocked at how advanced you were doing it and also more importantly where you were doing it and and how you were how you were recovering out of it so just very quickly talk about talk that through so that the the younger coaches can understand that concept yeah so next defense uh, that's, uh, that's, i don't remember where it came from uh, it's, it's been popular in in in, in the spanish league when you're in european leagues now for for quite a while um really the idea of it is just to part is to get the ball out of somebody's hands uh who who's could be a really good scorer um, or a really good driver, for example. Um, so that's the, that's the main objective of, of using it. Uh, what is it exactly? Um, basically, it's like, it's putting two, two v one pressure, no? But using, instead of using the, for example, if we use the ball screen, to, for an example, in um, ball, on the, ball on, the, on the 45 on one side, driving to the ball screen towards the middle, the opposite side guy shooting over or shooting over the moment that the, the ball handler takes the screen to go 2v1 on the ball. That's that's basically an example of using next defense on the on the ball screen, no, to force that guy to pass, no, to give him a, an option and no, impl not implicate uh, your big guy in the in that defensive situation as well. Um, so that to be the stop fouls or or because you you because you you know your big guy can't guard the ball very well, for example. So it's a good op option op option to to make the to make the ball handler pass, but it doesn't have to just be in the pick and roll, for example, on a mismatch, an outside mismatch with a with a ball handler versus a big jump into to next to make that guy pass the pass the big pass the ball and then rotating out of that. It's another option. Off screens you could do it as well, you know, as the for for, for a pin down, for example. So just on the ball screen, just example, um, that player is coming off the screen, the weak side top player is now stunting to the ball and taking the ball basically and so, now the person that's been guarding the dribbler is sprinting and what would what's the word terminology and the words that you use he's he sprinting to the furthest help player like the furthest player away from help and then that other player is rotating up to the next to the next help is that is that what terminology would you normally use yeah, we just call it yeah, no more vertical uh, vertical rotation, no, or horizontal rotation. But rotate. There's there's two 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 types. For example, in a hypothetical situation like we're talking about now, where we're going from from 45 to one side to the side where there's two perimeter players sure. waiting on the on the perimeter. For example, this is a, a perfect situation where you could do it because you could jump from the other 45 to the ball, and go yeah. two one on the ball, and that guy from the corner could slide up to take the 45, 
and the guy who was originally beating him on the ball screen could sprint to the corner and then we solve it with a with a rotation between three. Also, if we're good and we're quick and the pass is poor, if they pass to the 45, we could just rotate between two. So the guy jumping over from the 45 takes the ball and the guy who was beaten takes the guy on the 45 if we're, if we're quick really and good. if the pass doesn't have a, a lot of quality. But the rotation between three is probably the most common the most common one uh, that you would see because normally the pass is, goes quick if it's a good passer and then you rotate between three and you try and resolve it in this, that scramble situation. You try and resolve it, try and resolve it there, no? Yeah. But that would be an example of, of, of where you would use it. But really, it's that. It's a surprise action. And we don't always we don't always do it as... Um, we'll do it as a fake as well. So we'll fake to go to the ball, to make him pass, and then we'll go back. Right. So it's the other thing is also, it's playing with a little bit with the with the emotion of the player with the ball. You know, uh-huh. you know making him doubt, sometimes going, sometimes faking and going, sometimes not going. It's also, there's the, the mind game in it as well. Sure. You know? Interesting. And, you know, just to say, um, you know, I had the concepts in my mind. I'd never, never taught this and never ran this. Um, I experimented one or two times in, pr- in a practice about it. But um, one thing that I was shocked at when I saw the clips you sent was, you know, just the fact that that player, as soon as he came off the, off the, basically the, the square of the screen, um, he was being attacked um, by that player. And, and he, he had almost no, nowhere to go to make that pass you know he would have had to back the dribble up and then it was the easy rotation out i was really impressed by uh, by what you use because you know most uh, a lot of teams especially on 45s on side ball screens uh, are just down in those ball screens you know as a as a common mm. common fact so but you do specify that the your ball screen pick and roll coverage is player led unless there was a situation say out of a timeout or a special scout situation is that is that correct exactly so yeah the scout report the scout report obviously it governs everything though but from the scout report we'll have different recommendations though for for example on the on that ball screen a good idea is to go hot because we don't want it oh, sorry hot next yeah go next you call it hot the, exactly. we, we call it yeah. hot but it's yeah. but it's but it's next defense so yeah. we'll go next because we want to force the ball out of his hands and maybe he's not a good passer. So that's a good option. Instead of going show, I mean, implicate our big guy if he's a good driver, but not a good passer. Okay, let's go in next and make him pass. And we accept the, accept the risk that if the ball arrives to the corner and they shoot a wide open three, which can happen a lot because it takes a long while for us to close out to the corner, then, okay, we accept that risk. No, but that, we, that comes from the scout report. But, mm. you know, the players, the, players have that, the players have that freedom to decide. You know, okay, in this situation is a good idea, but you could also do this. If you arrive a little bit late, well, play the drop defense, play the drop defense, and we switch at the end and we try and resolve it like that. Because in the end, it's the players that are the ones who are, you know, the ones that are the actors on the court, if you like. No, but again, like you, like you said, no, there are some situations where, uh, okay, in, in the plan A, it's not working. they have given them ideas. Okay, plan B, we're going to go show in all these situations from now on because they've killed us in, in, in this. Okay, that happens. That right. happens for sure. Interesting. Yeah. Great stuff. Um, okay, uh, talked a little bit about the Spanish system, but you know, let's talk about you. You're you're fully immersed in 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 the Spanish way of playing now. The Spanish lifestyle. Obviously, you've settled there. Uh, you have a young family. You you learned the language. Um, what about um, you know looking back at the UK? You're still back involved in in national teams now. Um, at U20, which is fantastic. Um, what about your thoughts on on British coaching and the coaching fraternity? Um, do you feel that, uh, that you know that, you're, that there is a link to you there, or you feel that there could be a better like we we should be doing a better job of reaching out to someone like yourself? Well, I was oh yeah, like I, said, I was in the U20s, and now I'm out of the. I've been out of the U20s now since Sorry. they changed the the last cycle. Changed that's the, right. Yes, changed the coaching yeah. staff on that. Uh, I would have liked to have stayed in it, but it kind of coincided with the birth of my son, uh, the, the previous summer. Although there wasn't a European Championship anyway, but uh, wouldn't couldn't couldn't participate because of that basically. But there was interest from them to from the federation to have me involved. Um, but uh, yeah, I like uh, the the coaching fraternity. I think um, I think there's some really good coaches, some really some really talented coaches in the UK, and and a lot of the contacts I have are uh, come from first or from from Essex, from the from the East Region, where um, I had you know grew up playing and, and grew up coaching. We you know with Ross North, Mark Lloyd, Darren Johnson, Nick Drain, these kind of these kind of coaches. 
And then the other coaches from the national teams, uh, from the, whether that's, you know, your, your sister Neil, uh, with Troy, with Troy Carley, uh, Mike Bernard, these kind of guys, Mark Stutel, all these kind of guys were kind of had built connections with through the national team, Steve and, and Carl, of course. Sure. Um, those are kind of that's kind of the, the the network I have within within British coaching because it coincided with with national teams. Um, there's not a lot of when I was in the UK there wasn't in that in that moment there was a little bit more but for now at least before the before the COVID situation there wasn't a lot of clinics there wasn't a lot of um, of resource sharing you know on the on the public scale I know between 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 different coaches different regions they have their own site circles and they come they come you know share share information share ideas between them but in terms of a you know a national framework where there's clinics where everybody's not getting to know each other and sharing ideas there's not too much of that going on and that, i'd like to see i'd like to see more of that to mm. be able to be able to participate in that as a as a as you know in the part of the audience to, to learn from the other coaches and maybe you know be also be able to share some ideas as well oh, um, i mean yeah i'm sure you could share ideas i mean just just on that subject there um do you think that what you have done is achievable for other coaches, um, other young UK coaches? Do you think that if they had maybe the mindset and then also, you know, like a drive and, and potentially, you know, like work in as many contacts as possible, do you think that someone else could fulfill how, what, where you've got to? Yeah, I think so. No doubt about it. I know it's 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 tricky because in in Europe, although Europe is has you know a, a very much higher level of basketball, this the the economic uh, level of of basketball in Europe is still not um, still not that great. There's still not a lot of job opportunities advertised, not openly advertised uh, job opportunities. You need to have a good network. You need to put yourself in situations, you know, where you can build that network. Go and watch clinics. Go and Go and watch practices. For example, here in Spain, many of the ACB ACB teams are are practicing with open practices. You can go if you have a contact or you find a way of getting it, getting into having a contact in in ACB. You can go and watch practices. You can go and meet coaches. You can have dialogue with with top level coaches for free, or you have to pay obviously your flight ticket and these things. But not, I don't think many people do it. Um, but having said that, it's like I said, it's not it's not easy to get on the on the job market. I like I said, I had a, a very very non traditional non-linear route to get into to get into where I got to and a lot of luck to get one foot in the door a little bit more luck to get the other foot in the door uh, was in the right place at the right time perhaps and um, that doesn't happen to everybody I know that for sure mm. um, but I think with perseverance building your network um, putting yourself in positions go outside of your comfort zone and and go and watch practices go and watch as many games you can in in the European in the European game uh, I think you can improve your chances that way but like I said, it's, as you said, it's, it's not easy. It's not easy at all. No, it's not easy. Um, very good. Last couple of real quick questions. Um, the uh, the players that you've coached just very quickly, because, you know, I, I, I can't stress enough and I don't know if people really understand. I mean, you are coaching in the second best league in the world. Um, this is as close as it gets to, of course, EuroLeague is, you know, would, would, would probably be a, just slightly above that because they're all the top teams. But, you know, the ACB yeah. as, a, as a domestic league is the second best league in the world, better than the G League. Um, you know, what types of players have you been exposed to and that you've coached in, in your time there in Spain? Yeah, so I've been really fortunate, actually. I had chances to work with and also very fortunate with the coach that, that I work for that's given me, you know, put me in positions to work with some really good players. And that's um, to give a couple of examples. Uh, Maxi Clibble was here for a couple of years. Now he's playing in NBA. Matt Thomas was here, who was uh, recently traded to, to Utah Jazz, I think. Uh, worked very closely with those guys individually um, during the time here. Um, I could give you a, a bunch more as well. Sure. Um, but those, you know, the kind of guys we had, and now even at, at the academy level, now we have Spanish national team players on our academy level, so a high level of youth players while working here, uh, with chances to play at the professional level one day. So yeah, I've been really lucky to work on the individual, specifically on the individual skills level, with some of these players, and hopefully help them a little bit in their in their journey to 
to, to wherever they are now uh, or, whether, or whether they will go in the future. Um, so yeah, that's been really fortunate. But like I said, is is a combination of of you know working hard and also being part of a coaching staff that's quite open minded and and that let, lets you puts you in position to to be able to be able to work with those kind of players if you like. I just that's a great segue into this last question. Um, you know, what is it about being in that environment that you know fuels you as a coach and continues to you know, evolve you as a coach you know is it um just the fact that you're immersed in the in such high level detail um that if you see something that you haven't seen before you're able to talk it through with people like-minded people what what's what's that what's that feeling in that process um that you're in yeah, I think it's a couple of things. Like you said, the, the immersion definitely is is something that 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 pushes you and drives you because every in in this in this environment, every coach is always trying to innovate, trying to find a way to beat this kind of defense, finding a defense to try and defend this kind of situation, um, trying to develop the players from a methodological point of view better. Always looking for a better way of getting to the players, getting to the players' mind, uh, getting this skill into the players' game uh, uh, game. You know the the skills sure. they have. You know. Yeah. developing their skills in that way to thinking of a better methodology so that's that's kind of a kind of an area and then you have the pressure from from the people you from your colleagues and your superiors you know even even at academy level you know there's pressure to to develop players to push players onto the next level and to and to win so you for you to be able to develop players you know you need to you always need to be keep developing uh, there's an expression here that is, which is um uh, no mejores and peores, which basically means if you don't if you don't improve, you get worse. Um, and that's the coaches of the player. So every day is a, every day is a, it's a constant battle to improve. You know, looking at different coaches, your colleagues are always challenging you. Why you, why do you work like this? Why do you work like that? Why don't you do like this? And that's that's really helpful. That drives you, and uh, yeah, the, that that makes you go back and make you think, and and it also improves you as a as a as a person as well because sometimes you, in the past maybe some have said that always. And you get a little bit demotivated. Somebody, somebody tell you, oh, you don't. I'm not sure you do that the right way. But over the time, you begin to understand that they're there to help you, mm. and that drives you to to be a better coach. So I would say a combination combination of all those factors um, make you every day. You know, looking for getting better, looking for uh, different ways to improve your players, trying to help your players the best way you can. Uh, I would say that's the that's the that's the underlying thing here. And you know you're still a very young coach um aspirationally you know are you you know you're you're happy where you are um you know the team has success and you're having success i mean do do, do you see a path that you know make that moves you on to some sort of head coaching role in the future uh, you know what what's what's your what's your thoughts on that um, I don't know. I think probably I'm, I'm best suited for, best suited in the assistant coaching role just because of just because of who I am as a in terms of my my individual character and as as the kind of skill set I have. Um, I'm kind of more of a I'm kind of more of a Swiss Army knife more than a, you know specifically in, in 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 one kind of one kind of area. Um, but I don't know. No, I'm very happy in in the role I'm doing. I'm trying to add value as best I can every day I can trying to improve my players and I think that's the at the end of the day that's the that's the thing that's gonna gonna push you on I think if you if you can improve players and you can you can show players that you, you know you're a good coach and you can you can help players achieve things then somebody's always going to be watching and someone's going to help somebody's going to maybe take and take a gamble and you'll give you an opportunity because of that um so that was that's my underlying uh, my my philosophy in terms of in terms of moving on you know I'm happy what I'm doing trying to make the best of, of any situation that I'm in and uh, trying to work hard, keep my head down. And uh, hopefully the players will, 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 will do the, you know, take care of the, take care of the business. And that will be a reflection of, of, of myself as a coach as sure. coach as well. I think the best players are with the best coaches and the best coaches are with the best players. And at the end of the day, that's, uh, that's, what, that's what we're all trying to achieve. Yeah. Okay. Three rapid fire questions. Um, favorite all time uh, basketball coach. Uh, I really like uh, Messina. I'm a big fan of Messina, following with his books and uh, his clinics and uh, his way of seeing the game, the level of detail, the demanding, the demand, demandingness he has with the with his players in the game. Really like him. Um, another one is uh, Mike Taylor, who was back one of my first coaching idols when he was a London Leopards coach many years yeah. ago. When I used to go and watch London Leopards, 
and now obviously a Polish national team coach. Um, so I'd say those two coaches. Awesome. Uh, favorite drill um, that you're using? Maybe the one of the favorite drills you're using at this moment. Yeah, I like this. Um, you call it odd man break. Yeah. This, uh, <laughs> 3v3, 4v3, 4v4, 5v4, 5v5. Yeah. I like this drill because it's um, gives you the chance to work on specific concept on the on the half court with the transference of the of the game. You know, with the defensive transition and the offensive transition afterwards. Um, I like that. I like that. Yeah. Awesome. We actually, I actually run it. You know, free throw, one v one, two v one, three v two, four v three, and build it that way. So. Uh, oh yeah. wow! I never, I never yeah, yeah, seen that. Yeah. That's Sorry, I'm, free throw. I'm take note free, of that. free throw. Free throw. What free throw is the one, sorry, and then 2v1, yeah. 3v2, 4v3, 5v4, 5v5. Yeah, and that's a two, sometimes that's too long. You know, that's a, a lot of preseason. It's a great drill in preseason. Yeah, that's a so, conditioning drill. Yeah, it's a conditioning drill. I take note yeah. of that. Yeah. Um, and then lastly, um, your favorite go to saying or statement? Oh, what's the one? The one I always use. Um, well, I already gave you one, which was, um, yeah. which is if, uh, you know, my and builders, if you don't improve you, if you, if you don't improve, you get worse. Yeah. And, like um, that. oh, it was the other one. The other one's gone out of my head. Yeah. We I'm, said I it last, last time. time. I thought, was it wasn't the one I gave you last time. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> Here's the funniest thing of always that we've actually got that on video. So I can find that. You can find it. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna, it I'm gonna, yeah. I was going to, I'm going to have a quick look because I, I do have it, but my head's gone completely blank now never get too high never get too low that's yeah, the one that was the one I, that was the one yeah. i always i've always kind of stuck with yeah so you never yeah never get too ahead of yourself and the things are never as bad as you think you are you know even the days where you where you you'd come off come off losing three games in a row and you think oh, it can't get any worse yeah. well it's probably not as bad as you think there's yeah. probably some good things in there as well and the same time when you've won six in a row uh just be ready because it can change on the Absolutely. change on a knife edge the, the uh, way you can win six lose six in a row the next the next month so yeah your at your level especially there's so many yeah the, the, the game yeah. the difference between winning and losing is my so it's so it's so small it's so yeah. small and it can change so so quickly you know you can be you can go everyone happy one week and then the next week can be completely different completely different uh mentality or different face in the club you know right Coach, listen, I, I really appreciate the time. I've taken two hour, two hours plus of your time now. Um, but you know, it's been well, awesome and big. and and really something that uh, I believe young coaches should um to really listen to because this is a, a great story. I know that you're gonna you do many, many things. I hope that somehow the British basketball will have you back in, in the fold in I'm pretty certain pretty soon, um in some sort of capacity. So just want to say thank you very much indeed. Sure. Thanks for having me. And then I'm always happy to help in, in anyone, any way, any advice anybody needs, then I'm always happy to, people are happy to reach out to me. No, no problem at all. Thank you.